Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone for some uh, usual uh, logistics. The slides of the talk are available in the seminar website and I will also uh, copy the link to the chat box soon. Uh, please feel free to uh, type the clarifications questions in the uh, Zoom chat. If you have more detailed questions, there will be uh, two or so uh, short breaks during the talk when you can unmute yourself and uh, ask the questions directly to the speaker. Uh, please do raise hand or mention in the chat box that you have questions. Okay, so uh, it's our pleasure to have Professor uh, Mohsen Bayati from Stanford today. Mohsen received his PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University in 2007. After that, he was a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research and uh, at Stanford University during 2007 to 2011, working mainly on graphical models and uh, high dimensional statistics with applications in healthcare. Uh, since 2011, he has been a uh, faculty at Stanford University Graduate School of Business. He received many awards, uh, including uh, the Informs Healthcare Applications Society Best Paper Award in 2014 and in 2016, Informs Applied Priority Society Best Paper Award in 2015, and uh, NSF Career Award in uh, 2016. Uh, today, he's going to talk about uh, worst case regret of Thomson sampling and a general framework to analyze linear bandits. Uh, Mohsen, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Debankur, for the kind introduction. And also thank you, uh, thanks to the seminar organizers for the invitation. Also thanks to all of you uh, for joining. Uh, so today I'm gonna be talking about uh, two papers that I've listed here, the references. These are both joint work with Nima Hamidi, who is uh, available today. In fact, let me just show you his pictures. Oops. Sorry. So this is Nima. He is monitoring the chat. In case you have any question, feel free to post. And in fact, I should say Nima is going to be in the job market this year. Uh, so, and uh, feel free to invite him if you want to know more detail about this because I'm not really covering all of the results in our papers here. Uh, okay. So let me start with a bit of motivation before we get to the more technical details. So uh, imagine you are in a hospital and your goal is to reduce infections uh, or certain hospital uh, kind of a adverse outcome. Now, you have two technologies that have never been used before for your population. And uh, these are treatments that say A and B, and you wanna figure out uh, which one is the best. And to make things even more complex, like imagine these treatments are really personalized, meaning, uh, maybe some patients will benefit from kind of an, a smartwatch solution versus some other patients may benefit from uh, an iPad-based solution. So it's really not a, like a one solution fits all. Uh, now, right, so, and, and for each patient, we're gonna pick one of these two solutions. Now, the best way to do this, as you all know, is to run an A-B test or a randomized control trial uh, to find out which one of these is the best. And in general, in the healthcare space, running these experiments is very costly uh, and some even perceive them unethical for certain uh, cases. You see FDA runs clinical trials for drug approval. I mean, FDA uh, requires those, but overall for something like this that I mentioned, like telehealth solution, it's extremely difficult to get approval from the uh, hospital managers to run such an experiment. So now, so in general, there is this kind of a cost, opportunity cost of running the experiment. Now, if you go beyond healthcare, go to tech companies these days, they run tens of thousands of these experiments per year. But even in the companies, there is an opportunity cost to run these experiments. Um, because at the end of the day, you're gonna see an example that there is a cost uh, for, uh, and let alone there are sometimes PR problems that appear. As some of you remember, Facebook ran a 
experiment and uh, there was a big PR problem for them. So in fact, uh, if you look at kind of an spectrum that there are settings like to the left that experimentation is okay and then, so these cases, and then there are settings that experimentation is not okay or not allowed. So to the right, we're gonna make greedy, like we're gonna want to make greedy decisions. We don't want to randomize uh, our decisions. And I'll be more concrete about these uh, in a few slides. Uh, so far, we are still in the motivation phase. And uh, now multi arm banded experiments sit somewhere in the middle. So in a way you randomize, but at the same time, you try to avoid it as much as possible using all the data up to that point in the experiment. In fact, the ideas behind this go back to 30s. In fact, that famous paper of Thompson and also these uh, papers in 80s, the main motivation for them is clinical trial because of the expensiveness of running them or sometimes unethical aspects. But tech companies that I mentioned in the previous slide uh, are in fact the main adopters, like in prior literature that were motivated by healthcare applications, basically all theory. You don't see them being implemented, which uh, I can talk about them in depth, but not today, that why they're still not fully implemented in the healthcare space, even though we are seeing a few examples these days. Uh, so tech companies are now adopting them. In fact, this is there's a page on Google Analytics that shows they are, how they are running these to pick uh, best configurations uh, for the publisher. So let me give you actually uh, one slide version of uh, this page. So they're describing that imagine you have two websites, A and B, with conversion rates 4% and 5% respectively. And uh, if you do some standard power calculations, you'll see that we're going to need about 20,000, 22,000 observations, roughly 11,000 uh, in each arm to detect the effect uh, with 95% power and 5% significance. So, and then the, the page describes that if you run a Thompson sampling multi arm banded experiment, you can have uh, the same performance in terms of power and significance, although I should give it, say there's a caveat, there's a Bayesian version of significance and power that they do, uh, but modulo that, they can detect the effect via much less uh, samples. So in a way, you end up running the same experiment, meaning you obtain, you find this better configuration B, uh, with, and then the main number we want to pay attention to is we basically ran 78% less, exper uh, we use 78% less samples. And in terms of conversion rate, that means we saved 97.5 uh, conversion rate. So what does it mean? How, do, how did we save? So imagine any user that we would have put on site A, we would have lost because we could have gained by putting that user on site B. So that's what here I mean by conversion loss. And uh, in general, like now, if you think of theoretically speaking, so, so far this article is all about like uh, empirics and numbers, and these are the numbers they use to really convince their managers how to run these experiments in the companies. But from a theoretical perspective, uh, as these results from 80s uh, tell us is that imagine you have N observations. Uh, now, if you run an A-B test, half of them go to the worst configuration. So we are gonna lose an order N in terms of conversions. But if we would be running an, a multi unbanded experiment, the conversion loss asymptotically is logarithmic in N. And uh, there are even finite sample versions of this result, of course. So from even theory tells us that it's a good thing to do these experiments. We will uh, find the best configuration and uh, we save. So the one thing I do wanna highlight, there is no free lunch. So the catch is when you run an A-B test, you really estimate the conversion rate of both A and B very accurately. What the multi arm banded experiment gives up is that it wants its goal is to Converge to 
figure out which one of these two is the best while not losing much throughout the experiment. So in fact, at the end of the experiment, it knows a lot less about conversion rate of A compared to the A-B test, so, but it doesn't matter for its objective. If you really need to know both conversion rates, uh, multi arm bandit doesn't help you much. Okay, now after all this introduction, so let's get a little formal. So this is a, a very simple setting. Uh, and as if you remember in the first slide, when I talked about those two A and B solutions, I mentioned uh, some in the healthcare or in many cases, there's a personalization aspect as well. So right now, I in this slide, there is no personalization, meaning I'm just saying A is always 4%, B is always 5%. But in, now consider a setting that A for some users has more conversion probability than B. So it depends on the user now. Because of that, there are these families of multi arm bandit uh, problems called contextual multi arm bandit problems, or even more general, linear bandit problems, uh, which I'm going to define in the next slide. So a stochastic linear bandit is specifically is a problem that at any, so t is denoting time at any time t, we have access to an action set, which is denoted by a script A. And an unknown parameter theta star, it's d-dimensional. All our actions are also d-dimensional. And the reward of a single action, so throughout the talk, I will use like bold caps, mostly like A, uh, to denote an action. So I have an action that is uh, in RD. And if you pull that action, you're going to obtain this reward with certain noise, which is we are going to assume it's sub-Gaussian. The decision maker, let's say, picks the action AT tilde. So that's so whenever you see tilde, that's what the decision maker action uh, refers to. And then the regret or opportunity cost, or in fact, in, from the previous slide, conversion loss is basically the best that could have been done in expectation. Note that we are ignoring this epsilon term here. Uh, so the regret uh, is the best we could have done minus what we achieved in expectation. So in the conversion loss case, like this was roughly for every round, like 0.05. And this was basically sometimes 0.04, sometimes 0.05 in expectation. So when anytime we made the wrong choice, we had this 0.01 missed, uh, error. Okay. And our goal is to minimize expected value of this regret as we are running the experiment over time, over a capital T periods. So capital T, in fact, throughout the rest of the talk, I promise I'm gonna stick with capital T. In the previous slide, there was N, but N will be gone, no more N, everything will be capital T. So now, so that's the setup. Now, let me just very briefly mention that why two important subclasses uh, like basically how we can get two important subclasses as a special case of linear bandit. So if you take the action set at time t, the standard basis vector for RD, we basically recover the standard multi arm bandit problem without any personalization. In fact, basically, if I had a d equal two, and then I had uh, our, my theta star was, 0.04 and 0.05. And th then this will give me exactly that uh, Google Analytics example, except of course here I have a Gaussian, I have a sub Gaussian noise there, it was a Bernoulli noise. Other than that, this would recover that example. And this is the example that we mostly see when we like look up multi unbanded problems. Now let's look at the more interesting example, which has personalization. 
that's K-arm contextual bandit. So in this case, you have patients arriving at time T with a p-dimensional vector. And uh, so this is basically patient attributes or uh, yeah, in general. And the reward, so now I have say K arms. So K, little K is the number of arms. And whenever I pull an arm, K, I'm gonna have a, a reward is linear in a parameter beta i that is arm specific. So this is called k arm contextual bandit problem. Again, uh, in two slides, I will drop the parameter beta and p. So we don't need to, uh, you don't need to pay attention to them. I just wanna mention how this is a special case of that linear bandit problem again. So if you, so the top is just the linear bandit setup. In the bottom, we are just demonstrating the mapping. Now, if I, Remember P was dimension of X's and betas. So if I define my action set at time T to be these vectors, so it's like blocks, uh, K blocks of size P, and I define my parameter theta star by uh, stacking all those arm specific parameters, I'm gonna re recover the uh, here I'm contextual bandit problem. I do wanna highlight one important point that you may have like initially thought why this action set was allowed to change in time. It was allowed to change in time exactly to cover an example like this. There are papers, like there is, uh, there are results on the linear bandit when script a, uh, T or the action set at time T does not change. It's always fixed. Uh, we want to allow that to change to cover examples like KM contextual bandit problem. When I say we, like we didn't introduce this. This has the changing action set version of linear bandit has been introduced before and there are interesting results on it as I will mention some of them in this talk. Okay, so now let's talk about algorithms. So first, the first algorithm that is good to see to build some intuition is the greedy algorithm. Uh, so, we're gonna use uh, script H to denote the history. So imagine I'm at time T and this denotes all the actions and corresponding rewards in the times one to T minus one that we have obtained. We make some estimate of true parameter from this. So the, like one suggestion would be let's run ridge regression uh, on these actions, which are all vectors. Uh, let's use them as covariates and the R's as uh, rewards as a response. So we can obtain this estimate. So what, oops, what we want to pay attention to is this uh, theta uh, hat, which is our estimate. Then based on that estimate, we pick the best action from the action set. So this is where we make a greedy decision based on our estimate. And then after that, we observe the reward of the action that we chosen and we update our data. And kind of a cartoonish version of all of this is uh, we, we start from some data. At this point, we make an estimate, we take some action and then we update our data and go back. And in fact, this cycle that is closed, so the fact that there is this feedback is causing problem for an algorithm like greedy because uh, it's not difficult to see that the estimate theta tilde theta hat is a function of prior data therefore and that led to our decision to pick a t tilde so basically this action depends on the prior actions so we're going to create correlations on say, because remember we ran a ridge regression. So these A's are really covariates for the ridge regression. So we created dependency. And in general, uh, if I have a, say, even think of a re linear regression. If I run a linear regression where features like or various samples are not IID anymore, there is no guarantee that as T goes to infinity, these will even converge to the true parameter. So in general, uh, this can be an issue. Yeah. 
In fact, uh, there are some recent results that show that sometimes in this greedy algorithm does work uh, if the uh, actions are diverse enough, but it also fails in many settings as I will show. Uh, and we have some simulations to show you. Okay, ah. so one thing I wanna highlight here is uh, because of this problem, we wanna create exploration. So in an A-B test, at this phase, you always randomize. There is no greedy decision-making. You just make a random decision to block this cycle. Now there are these multi-arm banded algorithms, uh, which we will talk about them like Thomson sampling or this like kind of a OFUL, uh, uh, which are, are well-known in the literature as like also UCB. They try to deviate from greedy decision at this phase by injecting some randomization. Okay, so let me now uh, talk about these various algorithms in our setting, a stochastic linear bandit setting. So Thomson sampling is Bayesian in nature, uh, which means we are assuming the true parameter is random from some prior. At time t, you calculate a posterior distribution. So given the data we've, no, we've seen so far, so remember this is prior actions as well as observed rewards. We calculate a posterior distribution, and then this would be Thomson sampling. Everything is exactly like the greedy except the highlighted terms. In the greedy, for the green step or step two, we use the ridge regression to get a theta hat. And now we have a theta tilde, which is uh, a random sample from the posterior. But then we just plug in exactly the same theta tilde in a step three instead of theta hat and make a greedy decision with respect to that sample. But because at the step two, we did a randomization, we block this cycle kind of. So that's Thomson sampling. Oops. Now let's talk about the OFUL algorithm or the UCB based algorithm. So this one, there's a bit of a notation first I introduce. Uh, so this true parameter is estimated first via ridge regression. And for the sake of like simplicity in this talk, anytime I say ridge regression, just assume this lambda regularization parameter is one. So lambda is one anytime in this talk, just to make things simple. Now, this is just basically how you obtain the ridge estimator. Uh, and these A tildes and Rs are just past actions and rewards. So we, and this is just the identity matrix, the D-dimensional identity matrix. So this matrix VT minus one is an important entity, which it appears everywhere in the talk. So if you see VT, so this is the slide, slide 15. Given that you have the slides, you can go and look, look it up again. So once we have these, we can construct a confidence set, CT. So CT will be all parameters theta in RD. So to the right, let's just look at the right, which is a figure. So any parameter theta, uh, so theta refers to a, like a point here that has a distance with this norm, like this is the norm. So norm is a function of this VT matrix. Uh, that is less than uh, the uh, a radius, which I'm just gonna, again, for simplicity, there's a little more involved terms in the paper, but uh, the gist of it is, it's something that is order square root d log t. Okay, so now, there's this famous result by uh, Yad Puri et al. that uh, with very high probability with this construction, the true parameter lies here. So you may have seen like that I put this true parameter here. So this is a very high probability event given the construction that you see here. It uses self-normalized processes uh, theory to obtain this result. It's a very nice result. Uh, and once you have that, you basically obtain 
this algorithm exactly again same setup as Thomson or Greedy except there are these highlighted changes so the step two change is pretty much similar so now instead of uh, theta uh, like again we use the ridge estimator but the most important change is this one in Greedy and in Thomson this one was just a dot product, but here there's also a supremum over this set uh, CT. Okay. Uh, let me move to the next slide. So there is this algorithm called linear Thompson sampling. It's basically the same Thomson sampling algorithm, except it assumes noise and prior distribution are both Gaussian. Again, for simplicity, I'm just going to take identity for the covariance matrix of the prior. So it's normal zero identity. And the reward of each action is just noise variance is also taken to be one. If in that case, this posterior calculation, which in fact, the most difficult part of running Thomson for very general uh, distributions becomes very simple. It's basically gonna be a normal. And the most important point are our friends. The mean is the ridge estimator that we introduced in the previous slide. And the variance is inverse of that VT minus one. So, and now this is a very simple algorithm really to run, uh, which is why it's very popular. So it's simple. There are other reasons it's popular that I'm gonna mention. It actually performs really well, most cases, or I would say in a lot of cases, like in fact, the Google Analytics page describes that it's a simple algorithm, performs really well, it's easy to explain it to our managers. Uh, so, Now, let me also highlight actually what is this graph and also the parameters uh, for those who are curious. So the most important thing is uh, basically we run a simulation uh, for T equal 10,000, like from little T going from one to 10,000. And each, and we run a simulation like 50 times. And these results that you see are averages and standard errors across these 50 independent uh, settings. Uh, and the y-axis is regret. Remember the quantity that we were trying to minimize, the cumulative regret as you add uh, the losses from time one to time little t, as little t goes from, so this is really little t. Uh, and this is regret at time t graphed. So as you notice, Thompson is doing really well. Awful is not that great. Uh, and Greedy, in fact, uh, does really bad in this example. This is, remember, I mentioned sometimes Greedy performs bad. And this is one of those examples. So uh, and in fact, this example is motivated by the uh, contextual bandit, which is uh, I've denoted here. Uh, there are 10 actions. So this is our action set. And uh, but the number of dimensions is 120. So each uh, xt is uh, 12 dimensional. Okay. So other than simplicity of explaining, it is uh, empirically performing well in many settings. There's also some technical reasons, not in all problems, but in certain problems. For example, imagine this action set is a polytope. For Thomson, remember, we are maximizing a dot product. So it's an LP. It's computationally very efficient to calculate that maximization of dot product over a polytope. Uh, but for OFO, we are maximizing a supremum. And that supremum may sometimes involve a norm. So this is like a norm maximization on a polytope, which is in general NP hard. So for general problems, uh, running awful is actually computationally difficult. 
this is another reason that Thompson uh, has some uh, popularity like greedy. Okay, let me spend one slide. Actually, uh, let me see. Yeah, let me spend one slide to talk about uh, this notion of Bayesian versus frequentist regret, which is going to be important. So remember, we said regret of an algorithm up to time capital T is given by this summation. If we take the expectation with respect to the all randomness in the problem, which in fact, there are four sources for randomness. Noise, the action set, remember, in the contextual bandit action set is was random itself. There is randomness that algorithm creates, like Thompson, the randomization that it does, and the prior distribution. So if you take the expectation with respect to all of this, you get what's, what we call as a Bayesian regret. But as if you remove this one, meaning you have a fixed theta, it's not random anymore, then we get this thing called frequentist regret for a fixed theta. And in fact, uh, sometimes like uh, we talk about worst case regret, which is like there is a parameter theta that makes things like what, what, what would be like the worst parameter theta star for an algorithm? Now, let's give you like a quick summary of existing results on this. So there is in fact a lower bound by Donny et al that the expected regret uh, cannot be better than uh, this D, like the ordered parameter, of course, they're, they're like, you know, everything that I say here, I'm skipping logarithmic terms. So I'm only focusing on like terms that are more like, like, like a square root T type in uh, square root in T. So this is the lower bound. Variants of awful algorithm have a, a upper bound regret of, uh, which is basically up to these logarithmic or constant terms matches the lower bound, uh, which is uh, the root T again. Thompson sampling. Now, one thing I want to highlight, like, so these results for awful are frequentist. So therefore that you can get a Bayesian uh, regret bound for them as well. Like if the expectation for every theta is less than that term, then if you expect take expectation with respect to all theta, you're going to get a Bayesian bound as well. For Thompson, there is a Bayesian bound, which is D root uh, T due to Russo van Roy, very nice uh, paper, in fact, uh, that gets this result. However, when we want to do frequentist, uh, things get a little delicate with Thompson. So in fact, let me introduce a variant of Thompson, which I'm going to call inflated linear Thompson. So the only change is here. This variance is multiplied by beta squared. Or basically, it just means the uh, every random sample is multiplied by a factor of square root d, a square root a beta, sorry. Uh, sorry, a square root of beta squared, which would be beta. So, but everything else is the same as the linear Thompson. So now with this definition, the main result for linear Thompson in terms of like worst case is in fact, there's this additional square root d term in the regret and it does require the inflation factor be root D. So from a theoretical perspective for worst case regret of Thompson, we're gonna lose a factor root D compared to the lower bound. Like remember awful, even the worst case result matches with the lower bound. But for Thompson, at, at least in terms of theory, we don't know. Can we close this gap or not? <clears throat> and in fact, let me show you empirically how this does. The, the same simulation as in the few slides before, but let's use exactly the same inflation factor. So this is indeed the red curve is the one that uses the inflation factor. And you see it's really bad compared to the, the other ones. So it kind of looks like that this is square root the inflation is a artifact of the theory and maybe it can be removed uh, 
there was it was conjectured by the uh, some of these previous papers that can we is this really necessary? Can we take uh, care of it with a different theory? And in fact, uh, our like first result is that it is necessary. We're going to show that uh, you cannot remove it, uh, meaning linear Thomson sampling. If you don't inflate, will have a linear regret. Instead of a square root t, it will become linear in t for an exponentially large time. I'm gonna stop here for a little bit before I move to the next part in case there are any questions that haven't been answered yet. Maybe like for two minutes, sorry, uh, like 30 seconds or so, I'll pause. Please feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions and ask the questions directly. Okay. As expected, Nima has done a great job of answering the questions, so no questions. Let's move to the second part. Uh, we want to show that this Bayesian analysis is quite brittle, in fact. In fact, the result is there exists a family of linear banded problems such that for an exponentially large time, Bayesian regret of linear Thompson is uh, linear. So let me just un like decipher this a little more. So remember beta was the inflation factor. And we said the prior papers said, take beta to be square root D. So if you take beta square root D, then this is a constant. So it's okay for a constant number of rounds to have a linear regret. And after that life is great, which is why those results are there, but uh, this inflation is gonna hurt us on the regret as we saw. And this result shows that if you don't inflate by something of order root D, it will hurt us on the regret even more, uh, linear in T. So how do we achieve this result? So we're gonna in fact construct two sets of examples. I'm only gonna show you one set of examples that uh, this kind of problem happens. And then after I show you the examples and some simulations, I will try to discuss uh, under what conditions these, like are these very obscure scenarios or they're very generic. So I try to sum up, come up with a family of conditions that uh, under which the linear Thompson does not need a, such a large inflation and it will work. So, we will, we will take normal, again, this as our prior. In fact, what's striking here in this example is true noise is zero. But linear Thompson, of course, assumes noise is Gaussian. That's like by definition, linear Thompson assumes noise is Gaussian and it's just like zero one. And then let's talk about the action set. So again, what I wanna, uh, the remark one is data is better than what linear Thompson expects because the true noise is zero. So we are really giving high quality data to linear Thompson. And a remark two is you're gonna see the action set will change over time. And in fact, one may ask, is it really the fact that the action sets are changing? You're gonna see these action sets in the first example are chosen like, as it looks like by an adversary. But later we will show that we, will, we have another example, which I will not cover today, uh, but it's in the paper that no, you really don't need the action sets to change. Uh, we actually have an example for multiple examples when the action set is always fixed. But what is changing now is the mean or correlation mismatches. So let me actually go back uh, in this one. Here, we are not, uh, so Thompson, in fact, uh, not gonna assume 
that the mean of the uh, true parameter is non-zero, uh, like it's not going to assume. So, uh, but what I will uh, so that this prior is in fact uh, zero, centered at zero. But for those other examples, we're going to make the prior centered at some non-negative, uh, non-zero number. And uh, there is a version of it that we're going to deviate this from being an identity. So, but for now, I'm actually like so. What's interesting about this example is we're not making any changes on this. So whatever Thompson assumes is in fact uh, correct. The, all the problem is because of this noise mismatch. But I do want to mention that the changing uh, action set is not critical. So let's talk about example one. So there are three time periods, like the first initial time periods. At time one, the action set is just the, so remember, these are the basis vector. So this is a vector with the first coordinate equal to one. And, the, and in fact, in this example, we are taking a 2D dimensional problem. So the true parameter is 2D dimensional. First coordinate, so first time uh, we have the first basis vector. At time two, we give, give the algorithm the second basis vector. And uh, at time three, we give both of them E1 and E2. Now, what's interesting here is that, in fact, we call this like a bias introducing action set. What's interesting is that after the algorithm uh, is given these three, the linear Thompson sampling is given these three actions, at time four, it has an estimate. This is the ridge estimate. You can prove that this thing, this dot product in expectation is positive. Remember the true parameter theta star has a zero mean. So this should technically, if our estimate is good, uh, our estimate should have also a zero mean here. So this is a bias. And this bias is really the selection bias because of the noise uh, in our estimate. Now, how do we, we're gonna, so just consider this as a building block, this example. And now we're gonna, remember we have 2D dimensions. And we, so far we only use two dimensions, only E1 and E2. Now we're gonna have D uh, blocks of two in a 2D dimensional space. For each block, we will use the same action set in the next round and next round and next round. So take, D replicas of these bias introducing action sets. Each replica needs three time periods. So you really need 3D time periods. So once you do that, we're going to be basically introducing a bias for every pair like of coordinates to consecutive pairs of coordinates. We have a bias when you add those two pairs in that direction. So these are small biases. These biases are very small, but once you add them together, so from that time period on, the action set will be zero and B, which is the opposite of all those bias directions. So basically like, remember E1 plus E2 is the first bias direction. Then we have E3 plus E4, the second bias direction, et cetera. So all these bias directions combined together will create a powerful effect. What happens is we can now provably show that when these large probability that Tom, this linear Thompson selects the B, action B, which is against uh, direction of the positive bias, probability of selecting that is exponentially small. However, we know for a fact that this probability should be one half because true parameter is zero, right? So zero, if I have, if I, if I know the true parameter is zero, the probability that B is better than action zero should be one half. These two actions are indifferent really for uh, an algorithm that knows the true parameter. So, and that's the problem. Anytime, uh, the algorithm should have chosen B, but it doesn't, there's a constant regret. And these accumulate because the probability of making that mistake 
is in fact one minus an exponentially small number. Let me, in fact, here's a simulation that somehow demonstrate this. So what you want to think about is, so this is the D, the number of blocks. Remember the dimension was 2D, so this is D. And this is, think of this as log of uh, probability of that mistake, which is not taking uh, action B minus. So what the theory says that that probability is like e to the uh, minus a constant times d is exponentially small is kind of demonstrated by this linear curve in minus log of p of mistake. And uh, for the other example too, like uh, here we have another, like the example here is, I think uh, the prior instead of uh, being uh, at uh, zero is like shifted by 0.1 and we see similar scenario. And uh, this is, this is for, again, I didn't even explain example two. And uh, ju I'm just trying to highlight that this uh, probability of failure is really going down. Even now the effect is instead of linear quadratic, if you increase mu, mu is the amount of deviation we inject in the uh, expectation. And rho here is a correlation. So if we create deviations in correlation, remember the true, uh, like the, what Thomson thinks is all the correlations are zero. And now we inject the correlation rho and uh, the effect in that seems to be linear. Okay, so I will, I will try to give some intuition because this all seems a little bit so far uh, kind of like, where did this come from? Like, I will try to give some intuition when we are gonna to try to fix things. So I do wanna mention that there is some recent literature that, uh, so when Thompson uh, doesn't know the mean, but knows the variance, it turns out uh, it can be shown that uh, regret can be, regret loss uh, can be only up to constant. And in fact, there is, uh, it's in the same spirit of what, what we're gonna do next, because we're gonna talk about like, uh, so in a way we're gonna talk about uh, how to slightly modify Thompson or and under what conditions things work. So there's this paper that demonstrates that for the just the standard care bandit version, uh, a variant of Thompson actually does close the gap and doesn't need the inflation. Okay, so let me try to uh, answer this question of when does it work? And then it kind of builds on what we talked about uh, on example one. So before I introduce, I'm gonna introduce two assumptions, but before I introduce this assumption, let me actually try to give a little bit of intuition. So good luck to me to try to write down here, but uh, this pen is not great, but basically, Assume that the action set, like for the sake of intuition, assume the action set is just zero and a single arm A star, which is the best arm. And this means we want, like this means we have this thing, true parameter times A star is positive. But linear Thompson, lint yes, picks A star if this is positive. Because linear Thompson operates on theta tilde, which is the sample from the posterior, not from the, on the true parameter. So this is the theta tilde that linear Thompson operates on. This is the true parameter. And this is the reach estimate. And this is just like a picture of like this uh, Gaussian uh, 
distribution, the posterior. So Thompson makes a correct decision if this, this happens. So if this is positive, we are in good shape, right? As we actually, I wrote it up here. So let me, I'm gonna now modify this. Oops, oh man, and I don't know how to undo, but uh, okay, I'll, So this is, I'm gonna write this thing. Remember, I want this to be positive. This thing is, need, this thing is positive. And I want this thing to be positive. So I'm gonna write this as, in fact, my writing will end in a second. And we'll go to the picture, which is nicer to look at. So this is just algebra, basic algebra. So now if this thing is bigger than equal this thing, if the, this dot product now it's now easier to look at the picture. The left-hand side vector is the blue vector in the picture multiplied by A, which is this vector. So if the dot product of these two is bigger than the dot product of the red vector and A, then what happens is you can show that this is greater than or equal to zero. And in fact, Thompson will make the correct decision. So it all boils down to the fact that you want the dot product of the uh, blue vector by A be bigger than the dot product of the red vector by A. But what happens is, uh, so now for simplicity, we're just gonna call this like C, like the blue vector and this E, and I'll tell you where these come from. So E is refers to error because that's estimation error. Theta hat is our estimation. It's a ridge, ridge estimator. It's the center of the posterior distribution. And C is the additional error that Thomson injects. Thomson samples theta tilde uh, completely uh, randomly from this posterior. So in fact, I again did it, <laughs> removed uh, my writings. But what I'm uh, trying to say is, if this is C and this is E, all we want is that C times A star is bigger than equal E times B e star, actually, So if that's the case, we are good. But one problem that happens is the following. Uh, for a second, assume C, A star, E, they're all random vectors and they are all, uh, even for simplicity, you can assume they're unit norm, but uh, anything I say will be adjusted if they're not unit norm. So if they're random vector, this thing is of order one over root these are d-dimensional random vectors. In fact, the easiest way to see is just assume you have a unit Gaussian vector, and then the other one is just the first basis vector. So this would be of order one over root d. This would also be of order one over root d if they're all random vectors. Now, both of these are in order one over d in expectation. So the probability actually happens with constant the probability that this inequality happens is constant. So constant fraction of the time, Thompson makes the correct decision and it's okay. The, remember the example we constructed, Thompson making a correct decision was exponentially small. That's what we are gonna try to avoid. 
So this tells us that the problems arise when this E, in fact, by the way, this thing is always random. C is random because it's Thomson itself randomizes. Theta tilde is random. And it's independent of the optimal uh, vector A star. So this we always have, the thing on the left-hand side. What we don't have is the one on the right-hand side, that this thing is being order square root D. And in fact, it breaks down when this E is not random, which is indeed the case. If there is too much bias in the estimation error, uh, E can make the right-hand side to be large. And that's exactly what we did by that construction in the prior examples. And the inflation, all the inflation is doing is to make sure that the left-hand side becomes bigger. Because remember, if I make this variance a square, like if I expand everything by a factor of a square root D, then this theta tilde can go all the way up to here. So C becomes order square root D bigger and all the problem disappears. So this whole square root D business is because of uh, the fact that the right-hand side to this can actually become like a border constant sometimes. So if you want to now not inflate, we need to make an assumption. And that's why that assumption in the prior slide comes into play. So this is an assumption. So given that I have limited time, so I'm gonna actually just from high level say, so this assumption guarantees that and this is basically saying the optimal arm is diverse enough. Optimal arm is such that uh, we get the right-hand side of this thing of order one over root D. Of course, as you see, there is this norm. I assume these are unit norms. So, uh, but in general, everything, everything is general. So that's the arm diversity condition. We're gonna need another condition, which I not get into, uh, that is, we don't want this posterior variance to be uh, badly conditioned. So this is an example that shows E can become very large. The dot product of E with A star can become much larger when this is uh, too thin. So diversity is not sufficient, which is why we need this additional assumption that basically shows, uh, so this thing, uh, if, if the matrix, is such that the posterior is too thin, then uh, the operator norm becomes very close to this nuclear norm. And this becomes like a border root D. And that's bad. So we want this to stay roughly like say constant. And that's what we call like this thinness condition. So kind of we want this posterior variance to be well conditioned. So in short, our positive result is that if you have both of those assumptions, and uh, then you need only inflation. Remember, inflation that is has a, a square root D in it is bad. So this thing, everything is constant. All of these are constant, and there is a log T there. So if you do that, uh, then, and remember, this is just the thinness condition as it's appearing, uh, then we have uh, regret that doesn't have a square root D, additional square root D in it. I want to mention a remark that under exact same conditions of this theorem, you can actually make awful better too. Awful, you can basically shrink the radius of the confidence sets of awful by the same factor. Uh, and in a way you're, you're shaving off a, a root D from that. It doesn't improve its regret theoretically, interestingly, but empirically can help you. And I'm just gonna call that improved awful. And let's go to uh, like just simulate, this is exact same setup as before. So what's new here is this improved awful, which is now as good as the Thompson that doesn't inflate. And then, this purple one, which is now as good as the awful, uh, is a version of Thomson, which in fact theoretically works in the worst case. It doesn't need the square root inflation. And in terms of performance is as good as the original awful. So I am uh, actually, I just have like a 
two slides. How much time can I continue or? Uh, two minutes or so. Okay. Yeah, I have like a couple of slides that, yeah, yeah, I can wrap it up quickly. So I wanna uh, just show you like how this is derived, like what's the proof technique? Because in fact, the like so far, everything I said is one of the two papers that I mentioned at the beginning. So the second paper is in fact building uh, some, uh, uh, like there are some interesting results there that we actually use in this paper. So what we do, we introduce a new family of algorithms, which we call randomized OFO. Uh, the main point about them is at any round, there are these things called worth functions. And uh, by the way, this should be tilde. So instead of like what Thompson or Awful do, do or greedy, so we have these worth functions, which is a function of the, what's, what makes them interesting is that they can be a function of the history as uh, well as like RD. And the algorithm just makes a decision, greedy decision based on these worth functions. So, so far there's nothing interesting. What's interesting is that there are two conditions in that paper that we introduced. One is called reasonableness. The other one is called optimistic in expectation. And reasonableness roughly means that uh, the expected arm, uh, so there are some intervals that the expected, for each action, uh, the expected re reward of that action is close to this fourth function for that action with high probability. And optimism uh, basically means the squared deviations to, uh, of this worth function uh, kind of for the, compared to the true reward versus a true action, the best action, and then the action that we pick, uh, they're constant fraction of each other. Again, I'm not doing justice to de define these two conditions, but the most interesting part uh, I would say is the following. All of the algorithms that we saw today and some algorithms that we don't, didn't talk about today are special cases of Rofo. Thompson, linear Thompson, improved Thompson, awful, improve awful. Uh, they're all a special cases of Rofo. So we get a single proof for all of these algorithms regrets. And that's how we, in fact, there are positive results on Thompson uh, is obtained. Now this kind of unified algorithm, one other bonus that it gave us uh, was this algorithm sieved greedy, which I don't have time to introduce, but in fact, from a, like an empirical recommendation, like we're not gonna recommend empirical, like improved awful or improved Thompson, like from an empirical performance, this sieved greedy seems to be uh, working really well. Again, the details of this are in the paper, but this is an algorithm that uh, seems to be doing a great job cartoonishly like basically if you have uncertain uh, confidence sets around each action, uh, greedy would choose this arm, but awful chooses this arm and sieved greedy chooses this arm. It's not, it's just gonna eliminate some arms that don't have too much variation in them. And then among the remaining ones, it picks the best arm greedily. So let me summarize. Uh, we talked about, when there is prior or noise mismatch, Thompson uh, sampling is pretty brittle, uh, the linear Thompson. And we do need inflate the posterior variance and introduce conditions under which these problems disappear and Thompson works. Uh, the second bullet that I really didn't talk about much, uh, just mentioned two slides is we can recover existing results with a single proof and uh, obtain this new family of algorithms. Uh, what's, there's one thing that I didn't talk about is there are these gapped versions of the problems and gapped in meaning like average gap in general, uh, where all the square root t's become logarithmic in t or polylogarithmic in t. And we get the first type of such results for Thompson and Awful. Uh, there is a concurrent paper that proves uh, this result for Thompson. And in terms of open directions, I think it's very interesting if we can figure out a kind of an adaptive process, for example, that picks the inflation factor uh, based on the data. And we can prove uh, 
theoretical results for it. I think that's an interesting uh, direction, in my opinion. At the same time, uh, everything we said is for linear Thompson with Gaussian assumption and everything. So I'm. It, it would be interesting to see uh, examples that uh, Thompson breaks down, and we don't have this Gaussianity set up. Uh, it should be doable, as we know, like Gaussian results can be extended to like some more general distributions, but uh, needs to be done. With that, I stop. Okay, so let's thank the speaker.